So, Berto, you and I just watched the Allen versus Pharaoh documentary on HBO. Mm-hmm. First, first initial reaction in one sentence, Berto, what is it? Oh, my effing God. Yeah, for me, it was yikes, big time. And so in this episode, we're going to talk about the documentary. We're also going to talk about Woody Allen. We're going to talk about Dylan Farrow. We're going to talk about the evidence. And I'm going to speculate about what may or may not be wrong with Woody Allen. We're going to talk about abuse. And so if you're triggered by such things, I would uh, listen with caution or not listen. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Berto? My name is Umberto Castaneda. I'm a pencil eraser inspector. Yeah, so big time yikes. There, I remember buying his story in the 90s. Did you? Do you remember when this came out? Let, let's start by this. Even though I might have heard more about it at some point, I sort of only knew that he married her daughter. Like the Sunni thing or whatever. Like that yeah. was sort of all I knew. But I must have heard more. And either I thought, oh, who knows, whatever. Or I don't know. Or I just forgot. or Because when I was watching the documentary, I'm like, wait, what? I honestly yeah. thought we were dealing with like how, how unethical or how whatever. all Any number of adjectives of like that he married her nearly underage daughter, you know. Yeah, I, I remember hearing the details, and in the 90s, it was, you'd get information from the news or MTV or something, maybe the newspaper, and it's no surprise, given how good Woody Allen was with media and how sort of avoidant Mia and Dylan, obviously Dylan as a child, was with the media, and how beloved Woody Allen was back then, and how far it was before me too, that the general gestalt that everyone had was Woody Allen was being framed by a a wrathful ex-girlfriend, Mia Farrow, who was manipulating her child, Dylan, and how how sad that was and how impossible it was to imagine that Woody Allen would do those things. Oh, and by by the way, he's an excellent actor. Right. And and an excellent writer. And and, and an excellent manipulator of emotion. Yeah, exactly. So when he's sitting there in those press conferences, it's like, you believe him. You're like, yeah, man, that's tough that you're going through this. So do you, what percentage do you believe that he sexually abused Dylan Farrow? Oh, uh, at the, by the end of the thing, I'm like, yeah, the zero doubt, like a hundred percent. It, my my so, math, sorry, my mental math was, okay, so on the, on the left hand, I have uh, a guy who absolutely did seduce and marry, or whatever, married one of her adoptive daughters at her very young, 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 young age, just as she was of age, and with a lot of rumors circling it. That part is undisputed. Like, he himself yeah. claimed that was the reason for the for the scorn or whatever right so that part's like so already we're entering in like well your your morals or your your boundaries are certainly questionable okay there's that yeah judgment second tons of movies tons of movies exploring this exact question of an older man and a and a very young woman right okay now this is all circumstantial right but that's on the left hand on the right hand we have these very credible accounts from both the victim as an adult as a child from investigative reporters, from independent independent uh, researchers and counselors and things, from the mother consistently, year after year, from siblings, and what has the mother been up to? What is all her scandals? What's, oh, she does like crazy amounts of charity work around the world. And so yeah, once again, like is some of this like not admissible in a court of law? Yeah, sure. For me, come on, get the F out. Yeah, for me, I was fairly on board but I still am holding out for this extremely unlikely scenario that something is a little different than the story that was laid out in the documentary, which we'll get into later. But there's obviously a problem with denying the account from Dylan because, as you said, Dylan has been consistent with the story from the beginning and said that it happened. And so why would anyone, including me, 
question that, Dylan. Said, of course, it basically comes down between Woody Allen's story and Dylan Farrow's story. And almost never, but it does happen, but almost never does a adult, an adult victim claiming that they were victimized lie about that. It's, it's if, you know, 99% of the time, no one says anything because they know that they're going to be ostracized, particularly if it's someone like Woody Allen. And so she has every reason not to say something and not a lot of reasons to say something, especially as an adult. It'd be one thing if she claimed that as a seven-year-old and then just wanted to put it behind her, which many victims will do. It's another thing for her as an adult to be like, no, no, I remember it happened. And... Uh, that it just would be extremely unlikely that she would lie, but can't, might she lie? Might she have fabricated memory? You know, it's it's possible as a therapist who has been involved in these kinds of cases and knows the science. You know, I I, I have to leave that as a possibility. It'd be nice if we had a hundred percent certainty with these things, but we, you know, we just don't, and that's that's part of the problem. But do I believe Dylan? Yeah, of course. Uh, I don't. I don't, why would she lie about it? Now she might be, but politically and also advocacy wise, I support Dylan and what her statement is. And anyway, so watching the documentary for me, yeah, big time yikes. I feel so bad for Dylan Farrow and Mia Farrow for that matter, the whole family. And I, the documentary definitely lays out a story that is very compelling. If you haven't seen it, it's on HBO. It's very, it's pretty short. It's, it's just four hours. And for a documentary these days, that's pretty short, right? Yeah. I think Tiger King was like 10 hours or something. And so, you know, it moves pretty quick. It's pretty, uh, dare I say entertaining. Cause you know, it has to do with Woody Allen and all the people that they ran around with. And, and it, there's a lot of footage because Mia Farrow took a lot of videotape. She had a VHS home video camera and there's just a lot of home footage. Woody Allen without his glasses hanging around at the pool <laughs> and, right. and just these behind the scenes footage uh, uh, things. And I just have, we just have to add yet another person, another hero of mine oh, from God. my childhood to not only just someone that's problematic but like a genuine monster oj simpson bill cosby i know people are going to hate me for saying this but michael jackson maybe okay you know let's just say at the very least there's a chance that he was a monster i know a lot of people don't think he did it but roman polanski was not so much a hero of mine but definitely respected him but but bill cosby oj simpson woody allen i mean these were if you had like the Mount Rushmore of 80s heroes of mine or entertainment heroes of our society, these people would be up there yeah. uh, for sure. I mean, Bill, Bill Cosby in from 1983 until 1990 was arguably the most famous, per, aside from Michael Jackson and Madonna, maybe. And then you have Michael, and then you have Madonna. There's things about her. O.J. Simpson, just a huge, hugely loved person from like 1975 until 1985, and Woody Allen for so many years, just beloved. And it's just, it's yeah. you start to wonder: it, it was it designed to promote that sort of pe person into the limelight? Because we all understand that these sorts of individuals are rare. I mean, the, the things that Bill Cosby is accused of is extremely rare, right? The, and the behavior of Woody Allen is extremely rare. I mean, even people who abuse kids, you, they don't usually marry them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so it, it's, it's weird. Um, I wonder if the rarity, if there's sort of um, a push-pull with the rarity, as in... Yes, in general, it's rare, but would more individuals be like that were they given the opportunity? Because uh, not everyone has the power that a Bill Cosby has. No, no. Bill, if you or I No, no, had I don't Bill mean Co someone that wouldn't. I'm just, I'm just wondering, do we not get to see the full possibility of the percentages? Because most people don't have the kind of power that it takes to silence all these things, so they might be f afraid to to act on those instincts or on those impulses i know but it, it it's arguable that 
50% of the biggest stars, you know, the top 10 stars of the 80s, 50% of them are abusers uh, of the of a high degree. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, actually, you could even add him, even though he was more behind the scenes, uh, beginning in the 80s, moving into the 90s. These, it's um, just a high prevalence. And it, and then, so you wonder, well, if there, if we understand this to be a rare condition, what could be a factor? Well, maybe if you are a, a psychopath or a sadist, or there's something kind of off about you, maybe you're attracted to these powerful positions. You're sort of obsessed. But I think it kind of, so actually, let's sort of drill down on this. So for Bill Cosby, you could imagine, given his profile, that he would be highly driven to be charismatic and very charming as a way of trying to get his way, get get his victimization. Because he had a very particular shtick, you know, yeah. MO when it came to abusing people. He He wanted them to be, he wanted to pull them in because we all understand that Bill Cosby could have had sex with a lot of people who would be willing to have sex with him. Absolutely. Right. Maybe not everyone he wanted to have sex with, but a lot of people, particularly when he was younger. I mean, he would not be sex starved. Right. So it wasn't that he wanted sex. He wanted to uh, drug them and have them be unconscious and want them to wake up knowing you know, because he didn't try to hide the fact that he knocked them out. He didn't say like, oh, you you must have just kind of, you know, it was so obvious that, as to what happened that right. I th he, he liked it. He, I think he also liked the, I'm just speculating, but, and I go, of course, these are all allegations from dozens of women <laughs> for 30 years that he, you know, so I think for him, it could be that he was actually attracted to the limelight because it gave him that that ability to do that sort of thing. You know, maybe he also liked the limelight, but it, it, it was an added benefit. For Michael Jackson, if he is guilty, if he did, in, you know, any any number of those things, which of course none of us know because we weren't there. But if he did, then I think for him, his profile was one of immaturity and one of desperation and one of feeling comfortable with young people due to his attachment and developmental issues. You know, if Michael Jackson were just like your cousin and wasn't famous, I'm pretty sure everyone would say, something's up with that guy, right? There's just some, you know, because he was this giant star, you just say, well, giant stars are, they're kind of eccentric. But he was massively abused and was uh, uh, noticeably immature and, and noticeably interested in childish things. And when we were in the 80s, we just thought it was, well, Michael Jackson is this is this wonderful, you know, philanthropist of child welfare or something. But looking back, I think he actually just didn't like being an adult. I think he just really liked right. remaining a child and for reasons related to his abuse probably right and i think that if he did do those things i think that it was because he didn't feel comfortable with adults and he had a sex drive and so he targeted in a psychopathic manner children was michael jackson you know when you look at the bill cosby allegations it's a completely different profile and maybe a completely different disorder maybe a completely different motivation and then you look at someone like harvey weinstein to again totally different, more like Bill Cosby, someone who actually gets off on, again, Harvey Weinstein could have had sex with a lot of people. He's a very powerful person, but he liked forcing people to have sex with him. He, he wanted to some degree, the coercion that was a, that was a part of it. And then you look at someone like Roland Polanski, who seemed to genuinely just be interested in young people for sort of common pedophilic reasons. And then you look at someone like Woody Allen. So let's get into it about like, why do you think, so when we talk about these different types, well, actually, let me talk about the different types. I'm gonna skip down to my notes. Oh, and uh, sorry, so, and I, I'll, I'll mention, uh, this is probably related to different types because a Roman Polan Polanski uh, doesn't deny it and actually claims, well, yeah, you might find it weird, but that person was into it. 
Uh, and it's a very different situation from uh, this, what, if you are to believe the Woody Allen, it's like, oh, not only are they lying, they're, they're a chronic liar turning the whole family and ruining those children by lying. And like, it, it's, it's crazy. Like, because, you know, you could have imagined someone breaking down and saying, oh, God, I did it. I have a problem. Can we please I'll go to rehab or whatever. Right. Instead. Nope. No, I'm going to take my, your kids away from you and you're and you are, you know, you are the problem. And, right. and it's all lies. And <laughs> yeah. So the different, and this is my typology, there's been many proposed typologies of offenders of children, sexual offenders of children, but this is my typology based on my uh, minor expertise given how many times listeners ask us to cover these topics, because this isn't a clinical expertise of mine. I, I don't work with these folks. I mean, I have, but it's not a specialty by any means. So these are my type. This is my type because the the typologies that I've seen in the research, I'm like, oh, I don't know if that really fits my understanding. But so number one are pedophiles, people who are attracted to minors. Uh, these individuals can be psychopathic, meaning that they can lack empathy or they could have empathy. There are plenty of pedophiles, people who are seemingly born or at, when they're when their sexuality develops, they just they're just oh my god I, i'm attracted to kids and plenty of them perhaps most of them actually have empathy and compassion and refrain from actually abusing children and they might fantasize in their mind or they might just try to shut down the whole sexuality altogether but th these are pedophiles now it, you could be a pedophile and also be psychopathic or justify your actions Maybe Roman Polanski is kind of in that group. Um, so, and pedophiles can be attracted to any age. They're, they tend to, you know, be attracted to a particular age. So, you know, every age group has its pedophile that's attracted to it. And second type is sadistic personality disorder, and also including as a subset of sexually sadist. So, so these people are just generally sadistic. And meaning that they get off on harming other people and children are just easy targets and sexual harm is just one of the various ways that sadists will harm people. So people who are sadistic in general will generally harm lots of people of, of every age in various ways. Just whoever is an easy target, they'll, they'll, just, they'll just harm them because they get off on that, whether it's uh, poisoning someone or pushing someone downstairs or insulting someone online they just they love it it it's a rare condition extremely rare but they exist and we've studied them and then a subset of this is people who actually are sexually sadistic and this is someone like ted bundy he, ted bundy had a number of other labels we could apply to him but he clearly got off sexually by raping and killing and it wasn't just that well anyway so so that's sadism that's the second type and there's a lot of people in that group and the difference between sadists and pedophiles is against sadists it, children are just easy targets for their harm and if they could harm anyone they would it wouldn't matter if it was children or not um the third type is what i'm calling the the mimicking type and this is actually perhaps the person you were abused by berto mm -hmm. she was in all likelihood abused when she was younger. She was 12, right? Yeah. When she abused you. Right. And uh, who knows, but she could have been a pedophile. She could have been a sadist, but it seems possible that she was abused and she just mimicked the abuse as a 12 year old uh, towards you. Uh, these people might grow up to have regular sexual lives and not reoffend. They might not be sadistic and uh yeah so there's a fair amount of people usually these people are children the the mimickers are usually children so if someone abused their younger sibling and then went on to not abuse and not have an impulse to abuse anyone later in life then they're probably in this camp this this mimicry or sort of uh sexually abused reactivity type uh, now, of course, those people can mimic throughout their life at, you know, at the age of 30, they can still, quote unquote, mimic what they were 
uh, right. shown. The the fourth type is sexually compulsive type. These people, it's sort of like OCD. They essentially just have an overwhelming urge to have sex or to touch other people in certain ways, maybe even to uh, violate them. And I actually worked with someone like this in my past, and it was it was a thing to watch. It was scary. The the amount of time that he spent thinking about sexually as violating other people like on a second by second basis and wow as soon as he was given an opportunity and i would and i saw it happen as soon as he was given a chance as soon as someone wasn't eyes on him with within a second he was he was on his way to harming someone physically unbelievable yeah it was it was shocking uh, to, to it was an obsession of his it wasn't something i don't i don't think he had any control over because it was completely ruining his life it was so out of control it was so noticeable that everyone right. knew about it and prevented him from you know he 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 was shoot everything in his life was falling apart because of this and you just wonder like hmm. that doesn't seem like you have any control over it right that's a pretty rare condition and then the final one is what i'm calling the regressed type and this is what if michael jackson did it again <laughs> can you tell that the internet <laughs> is a little divided about the Michael Jackson issue? No, I wouldn't um, know. <laughs> if, if Woody Allen did it, uh, then he would also, I think, be in this camp. They are people who basically only feel secure with younger people for various abuse reasons or attachment reasons. These people are often introverted and have a hard time relating or feeling comfortable with people their own age yeah. and so and we see this all the time in normal terms like you'll have a tw I, I worked when i worked with families i would work with a lot of teens and kids and uh, you know one in ten of the kids i worked with a frequent report from the family and the school was that the kid liked hanging out with younger kids oh, that okay. you had a 10 year old that didn't get along with other 10 year olds they got along with seven year olds really well mm. and they would often feel kind of like a big brother to the seven year olds in the neighborhood and we would observe and you know they played uh, appropriately it didn't harm anyone but you could clearly see that the 10 year old just felt kind of like a seven year old yeah or the 13 year old felt like a 10 year old a 13 year old girl when she hangs out with other 13 year olds they're talking about whatever 13 year old teenagers think about you know either i don't know what do Billie Eilish or, yeah. well i was gonna say it was like a, i was gonna say hannah montana but that's like 20 years too late <laughs> but you know stuff like that right that's like tween stuff right and some 13 year old girls are just like what like you know if you have a 10 year old girl hanging out with 13 year old girls the 10 year old girl won't be able to relate probably well, if you feel like a 10-year-old at the age of 13, then you're going to play with you. And we could imagine that being exaggerated where a 56-year-old only feels comfortable hanging out with a 7-year-old or a or a 15-year-old. We, we could understand that as long as it's not inappropriate or sexual or harmful. We're like, okay, that's fine. In some respects, you, you just relate better to younger people. Yeah. That's okay. But if you uh, also have attachment needs and sexual needs you're going to feel only comfortable with that age group and then you're going to make excuses because you need to get your needs met and you're going to harm other people. And I, I it, from the documentary, it just kind of looked like Woody Allen was that way. What what do you think, Bruno? That's, yeah. So I got the sense, look, ever since I've known about Woody Allen since I was a kid, and I would, I actually, I, I now wonder if it is because, uh, you know how sometimes when you've been abused... Uh, you both might sense certain things about people or you might might be attracted to people you might be able to abuse. You know that? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's a scientific fact, but that's sort of like informal mm -hmm. wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. Because I will say that from my own experience uh, when I was younger, I, I, definitely, I definitely could see certain predatory patterns to me, like finding out, like you kind of look for people that you could predate on. And I luckily never, you know, fully ended up going down that path because, and certainly not with kids or anything, but, but I could sense that something about my neuro, neuro 
uh, physiology or the way I perceive things uh, must have been affected by by those experiences. Anyways, and and similarly, and this might just be random, but I often do get weird feelings about some people. Like, oh, I wonder if this person's is like safe to be around if you're younger. <laughs> but anyways, with Woody Allen, from the moment I was a kid, I was always like, that guy is creepy. <laughs> now, really? Yes, yes. Now, it could just be because, you know, when you're a kid and you see this older dude acting all weird and funny, uh, or old, all weird, funny to some, maybe that's just odd. But for whatever reason, I never had a good feeling. Now, as I grew older and I watched some of his movies, I appreciated them. I'm like, wow, these are really entertaining. And then I kind of grew into his mannerisms. I'm like, okay. Because one of the things that really used to annoy me when I was young, probably in my teens, I was like, why does Woody, this Woody Allen character seems, seems to have a lot of female attention? Why? He seems like this weakling, like this soft-spoken weirdo. Like, what? And I was always oh, yeah. so annoyed about this. Like, grr, grr, why is he getting attention? Uh, well, he wrote it into the script. No, I, mean. I, I understand. But, but even in the news, like, it, you would see, like, Mia Farrow is beautiful, right? Like, that's his ex-wife? Like, what? So, um, okay, so I would think about that. All right, fast forward, I, I end up loving his movies and thinking, okay, I, I see. I, I'll see through his mannerisms. think the guy's a genius, blah, blah. Okay, great. And then I heard this thing about the, the daughter. And I, at the time, I remember thinking, uh-huh. There was something funny about him after all. But that's about it. Now I'm watching this documentary. I'm like, oh, yeah. Now it's clear as day. Like, the guy absolutely has these mannerisms and things. It's like he's still like a little kid in some ways. And, and sadly, and, and, the, and if, if this is all true, ends up manifesting as like he can connect emotionally better if they're younger. And I'm like, oh, wow, that is incredible. You've come full circle. Yeah, yeah. You've come back to realizing he's creepy. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if you're picking up on something, uh, you know. Uh, when people are abused, they often have a lightning rod for, or a good radar for that. They're both a lightning rod and they have a good radar, yeah. meaning that they detect it at least unconsciously very easily or more easily. And they're also a attractor because as you were talking about earlier, because of your abuse, it gave you some impulses mm -hmm. to abuse other people. And you would detect that, oh, that person is more easily victimized. You, you, just, right. you just had a sense. And it was never conscious. Like, I, I never once in my life had a conversation in my head like, ooh, I could abuse that person. It's never like that. It was always simply implicit. Like, I'm just going to push my boundaries here. But the, but in looking in retrospect, I'm like, oh, that's odd. Right. How coincidental that then I go and find out this person has been abused. Right. And that I've re-traumatized them by me pushing boundaries. Right. Hmm. Yeah. And you didn't push boundaries with a different person. And you think, huh, right. that person has a way about them that isn't the result of being traumatized. and. You, you, your radar was able to detect, though, you know, subconsciously, don't go there with that person, but do go there with that person, right? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So my uh, hypothesis, and this is, this is, as I was watching the documentary, I'm like, okay, this is interesting, because his presentation, at least the way the documentary lays it out, and, and knowing, and I've known a lot about Woody Allen up, up until this point as well, so it's not like... I'm just following the documentary, but, and looking into it more, I developed the following hypothesis. This is a total guess because I haven't assessed him. I can't diagnose from afar. All I have in terms of data is from limited resources, biased resources. So, but, you know, for the sake of education, I, I've seen this happen before and uh, I wonder if it's, this would be the hypothesis I would pursue if, if I was tasked by Woody Allen himself to figure out what was wrong with him, if there was something wrong with him. So the beginning of this, obviously, is something was wrong with his early childhood. Uh, was it abuse? Was it neglect? Was it subtle? I suspect, given his own story about his own childhood, that it was subtle neglect emotionally and discounting of who he was so that he felt when he was young that he couldn't really depend on other people, that... Uh, 
that would be my guess. And then, what's the? I don't. I'm not familiar with the story in in a, in well in general. He, he doesn't. Um, uh, without going into the details, I'll just say that I, I don't. I don't know. I can't really speculate about the particulars. I'm more sure. sort of working my way back from what I see as an adult, but okay. and there's some things that he'll say that sort of fit that a little bit, where he'll depict his parents as being not super warm and a little frazzled, you know? Hmm. Uh, so anyway, but who knows? So, I'd, but I would suspect that anyone who, if the allegations are true, did what he did, then there would have to be something going on in his early childhood. Okay. So it results in him uh, entering into adulthood, avoiding relationships uh, mostly because he realizes that he can't trust people. He doesn't. He doesn't feel good when he's around other people. You know, he has an urge to attach to other people, but he finds that it, it's hard for him. And he has a lot of quote unquote friends, but he, you know, he just has a really hard time trusting. When he met Mia, as is depicted in both Woody Allen's account and Mia's account they hit it off and he said, I'm not ever going to be a husband. I'm going to live separate from you. We'll see each other. Oh, true. Frequently. I'm not going to be involved with your children. It, uh, you don't depend on me. You know, oh, that, and by the way, that aspect, I found it so fascinating. I was, I was considering that his account is, Oh, I love Dylan so much. I spend so much time with her. And then Dylan's account of, the aspects she remembers about that were, yeah, she, he was like right there. In fact, maybe too much there, but there was that part of it where it was like, I want nothing to do with children. I never want to raise children. Right. I don't want to see a child. Yeah. No, there's nothing wrong with that, but it right. is particular. And it wasn't like he had a whole slew of other women that he was entertaining. It was, I think it was just Mia and he, he, he knew from in, in the be, from the very beginning. It wasn't like he started dating Mia Farrow, and as he got into, it, he's like, "Yeah, I don't know if I'm made up for, for to be a stepdad, or yeah, I don't know if I can really marry you and be a you know." He knew from the beginning. So up is before Mia, yeah. he had already learned I can't function in relationships. Now we have to assume that Woody Allen had all the normal attachment needs and all the normal desires of family and of closeness. But there was something about relationships from his early childhood that he just could not trust other people. And so th this was his way of managing. It's like, I want to have a relationship. I want to have a, a closeness, but I'm, it's too threatening. So I have to keep my distance. And, yeah. and Mia Farrow, by the way, acts like a child. Now, she's not childish. She's very maternal, but she has a very youthful vibe, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. her acting, her char the character she plays, the her in her, you know, that was one of the things I realized about this documentary was, oh, the character that Mia plays often is the way she is in real life. She's, she's quite yeah. meek. She's quite soft-spoken and naive-seeming. And well, I, we, we found out that she had this terrible bout with polio and that was traumatizing. Yeah. Uh, there's also something to, so on the one hand, of course, admirable that someone would adopt so many children. Yeah. But the, the flip side is that there is something to that, right? Like who is the person that wants to adopt so many children? Why? Yeah. Well, I could only speculate, but she was a very maternal, so she's both childish as a vibe in demeanor, which, and very non-threatening, like in terms of yeah. the way Mia seems to come across, there's just like zero threat from her, at least when you first meet her probably, right? Well, even in those recorded calls, yeah, when she's a hundred percent aware, if you believe everything, of what Woody is and what he's doing, and she still nice. sounds conciliatory. Yeah, very nice. And at the same time, not only childish, but also very maternal. You know, right. the, she is the all mother. <laughs> she wants yeah. she wants to save all the children. She wants to save the world. So she is a very attractive, yeah, literally. a very attractive person to someone like Woody Allen. If I'm, you know, my speculation is correct, that cannot trust people. 
if you can't trust Mia Farrow, you can't trust anybody. But it, but right. he, if but he can't trust people very well, so he kept Mia at a distance, and Mia eventually opened him up, though, and the family environment opened him up, and mm-hmm. the the way the family was, it gave him this like safe haven from all of the a lifetime of avoidance and pain. I'm guessing, mm-hmm. and he starts to realize, huh, maybe I can, maybe I can trust other people, and. Then uh, Dylan enters his life, and at first he's just like at, at arm's length, but then he starts to realize, huh, actually, if I allow myself to open up to Mia, and now I'm going to open up to this child, wow, this actually feels really good. I didn't know that I liked being a father, because, you know, from the beginning, he's just like, don't depend on me. You know, I, can't, I can't be a father. I'm not going to be a father. Yeah. But then he... And, and then from another interpretation, he knew he was a pedophile and, and he was trying to avoid. But I don't, I'm, in my hypothesis, I don't think, I, I think what happened was he bonded with Dylan and felt a feeling he probably had never felt before, which was, comp- you know, when you're around a child and it's your child and the child loves you back uh, the way children do. Like you are, you're everything, right? When yeah. when it's your child, your child wants your attention. Your child prefers everything you say. Your child, when they fall down, they they cry out for you. They, you know, you have this effect on your child, which is good, and right. uh, that's the way it should be. And if it makes all the sense in the world that that would be. And so I'm guessing that for Woody Allen, again, my sort of running hypothesis is that. He had that feeling, and sh- and Dylan gave that closeness to Woody, and for the first time in his life, he felt genuinely safe and close to someone. Because it's hard to feel threatened by a seven-year-old or a five-year-old child that loves you. It, it, right? It, they're on, <laughs> they're honest, they're uh, caring. You know, they 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 want to please you all the time. Uh, if you'll sit down and play Legos or draw pictures with them they'll just spend all the time they won't text other people they don't they don't <laughs> want to they don't want to leave you know if if you give them what they want attention and and non-complicated love then you know they just bask in it and it feels good and they give it back to you and physical too you know fi- it's it's hard not to put hands on with kids it's you know they they want to sit in your lap or they want to <laughs> bump up against you or they literally want to hug and or like when i was in uh I, my one of my first jobs in this country i worked at a daycare center for a summer really and i had two classrooms i yes. didn't know that i had the five-year-olds and i had the one-year-olds now the one-year-olds you know it's funny when you're a teenager you don't really know Especially, I didn't grow up in a household with a whole bunch of kids. So, uh, like, I was an only child in my household. So, I didn't really know what a one-year-old is like or whatever. So, in my mind, the one-year-olds should be able to do a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> but it was it was actually surprising how much personality the different little one-year-olds had. Yeah. But, but the five-year-olds, I would get in trouble because I would love... Like, they wanted to be thrown around. And so, like, I'd swing them by their arms, throw them up in the air. And this was pre tons of lawsuits but it was just starting so that i remember them like you can't do that their arms can fall out of their sockets <laughs> and I'm like what are you talking about that my uncles used to do this all the time yeah. it's like i know but you got lucky yeah I, I i you know i've talked about this before i had a daycare in my house growing up my mom had a daycare and they were all but mostly between the age of like two and five and yeah, just the cutest things and all they wanted to do is, you know, hang out. And and when I treated kids as well, you get down to the ground, play Legos, they want to sit right up next to you, particularly if they have attachment injuries. And I'm guessing that for Woody Allen, this was extremely intoxicating in, in some functional ways, that it was not only perhaps in the beginning good for Dylan to be close to another parent, but also for Woody, as for with both par- with a lot of parents, corrective because it just feels good to hang out with a kid that doesn't harm you, doesn't right. want to reject you, doesn't doesn't want to you know isn't thinking thoughts, doesn't sort of 
distracted by work or something. They're, they're just, they're there for you and they're, you're there for them mm-hmm. and it, it feels good. And I, I'm guessing in the beginning it was innocent and, and a, a good thing. And then it was, but it was, but because Woody Allen and all of his attachment injuries, again, this is complete speculation. I just have almost zero data. <laughs> Uh, the documentary helped me to form this, so there's sort of visual data or, or narrative data from from both Woody Allen and Mia Farrow and Dill that contributes to this. But uh, eventually, he's like, "I am now for the first time opening up a vulnerability in my heart that I've I learned to shut off a long time ago." And Mia Farrow, my girlfriend, gives me a little bit of this attachment need, but. Dylan really gives me this attachment need. Now, you'll hear me often talk about how clients will be sexually attracted to their therapist. And one of the uh, you know, conceptualizations is that as a adult and with a lot of attachment injuries, a lot of relationship trauma, and you've, you've been rejected and harmed and you finally find someone, your therapist, who is actually caring and a safe person, not only will your attachment needs come pouring out, like, please love me, please listen to me, please give me safety, but also your sexual needs will come pouring out because your whole body is saying, I want to be with this person whole. In, in, I don't want to just kind of attach to this therapist. I want to be completely attached. And a, a part of that system of complete attachment involves your sexual urges. Hmm. And... Right. Uh, and it's also the first person that you feel safe with. And so when your sexuality wants to find someone that you feel safe with to express that with, then it'll come out as well. So it's possible that for Woody Allen, and I'm not making excuses for him, I just want to be clear, that it's possible that for him in that intoxicating attachment satisfaction for the first time in his life, it, it, it led down a road where and they kind of laid this out in the documentary where it was a, a lot of one-on-one time and then it was a lot of cuddling time and then it was a lot of maybe naked cuddling time and then it was mm-hmm. a lot of sexual time and you could make the argument that in the beginning he knew he was headed in that direction he was just grooming the whole time it's possible that happens but another hypothesis is that he he was just going one step at it. He just wanted to meld with this other human being because it it felt good to him. It felt like safe and intoxicating, and it wasn't purely sexual. It was more attachment based, and the and the sex was an asterisk on that desperation. Now again, it's completely psychopathic to do such a thing to a child. It's wrong. It's victim to say anyone would know that. But when you're blinded by the possibility of getting some of your attachment needs met and you can feel safe, then you'll make justifications for that sort of thing. And then we also know it, it was a pattern for him because of Sunyi. Right. right. So then he realizes at some point, uh-oh, I've gone too far with Dylan. And also I think Dylan started pulling away from him because she didn't like being all consumed. You know, she w- talked about how when he was arriving, she would dread it because the sexual abuse, obviously, but also just the amount of coercion emotionally mm. that he would uh, perpetrate on her and pull her away. You know, it wasn't like he just said, hey, let's play. Do you want to play? It was, you are coming with me and we are going to hang out for the next 18 hours straight staring into each other's eyes. And she didn't She didn't like it, right? Oh, boy. And so uh, he realized, uh-oh, I can't, I can't depend on Dylan anymore. Well, but I've now realized that I can find satisfaction attachment wise. Well, there's this other kid that seems kind of reclusive and seems lonely and naive because in the documentary, they talk about how Sunni had never had a relationship and she was adopted later, like at the age of 10 or something or, you know, some, mm-hmm. and that's actually a specialty of mine. I've worked with a, particularly Korean kids who were adopted later in life. And oh, really? Yeah. At first, you know, I'm well, Asian, so I got referred. Yeah. A, you know, a lot of the Asian families or Asian adoptees, and there's a lot of Korean adoptees in Seattle in white families, and they 
often were adopted six months or later, and those kids who were adopted later have a much greater chance of having a massive attachment injury that can never Oof. be can never be healed. Essentially, their neurons developed you know, dur during a a critical time in an environment that actually solidified their brain for the most part in a way that makes it so that they don't really ever attach to people. And the oh. description that they had with Sunyi was actually really consistent with what I would see where they would, they, you know, Mia would talk about how she would really try to open, you know, cause they, she adopted lots of kids, but a lot of them were at birth or very young. And with Sunyi, she was older and she would try to connect with Sunyi and, and it just wouldn't work. You would hear Mia say that. And that this is a very common story that you'll hear, particularly from the main parent. It's often the mother. They'll just lament how, cause you know, to adopt a child, you love human beings. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you, you don't, you're not ambivalent about humans. You love humans, you know, especially that many. It's like, yeah. okay. Yeah. You must really love being a parent uh, to choose that. Uh, uh, several times and the complications that come with it and to have a child that you're giving and giving and giving and giving and like years later the child still seems indifferent to you mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder if Sunyi has that I wouldn't be surprised and so Woody Allen uh, starts kind of randomly looking around like well who can I be close to and then Sunyi comes along as this very easy target because she doesn't have support. She's not really connected to other people. She is naive. Uh, she is safe, maybe in the sense that she's not particularly demanding because she doesn't really care. She's just kind of good on her own kind of a thing. And also a lot of kids who are teenagers with these backgrounds will have to be quite rebellious and very much wanting to do self-destructive things. And so he bonds with her and then realizes, oh, but she's older. So if I just wait a little bit of time, I can actually meld with this person, this developmentally younger person that doesn't have a lot of personality outside of me, you know, Right. The way if I met a fellow 56 year old person, you know, they have their own friends, they have their own issues, they have, they have power, they, they can argue back at me. Uh, Dylan couldn't do that. And Soon Yi also can't do it. She's maybe she can do it a little bit more than Dylan can. But so it, this kind of is the best of both worlds because in his mind, he's like, well, she's almost an adult or she is 18 or somewhere around that age. And she has sort of the development of a younger person, which is someone that I feel comfortable with. And so this is my person, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. it started with Mia opening him up and then Dylan opening him up further and really intoxicating him. And then Sunyi comes along and says, you know, the world is saying to him, look, this is a, a legal, uh, you know, although extremely taboo and problematic <laughs> It's something that he doesn't legally have to hide at that point. At least by the time that they made it public. Right. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the other aspect of this is he, as, as was mentioned in the documentary, and I hadn't really thought about, but clearly it's the case, constant theme in a lot of his productions about these relationships between these older men and these younger women. And that seems to be something that he wanted to explore artistically constantly. Right. And why, right? Is it because, because yeah. he wrote those scripts uh, after Dylan and maybe during Sunyi or after Sunyi, right? Mm -hmm. So is it some kind of wrestling with his own uh, discourse of, because in Manhattan, for example, he was, although involved with a 17 year old, which is just bizarre <laughs> to think about a movie being made where the main character is having a, a sexual relationship with a child and that they allowed that movie to get made. You know, it's just, it, times are different. <laughs> right. And he, in reality, because the narrative was that, well, I forget the, the gal, but someone said, yeah, I, that, that was about me or it was inspired by me. Right. It's uh, Hemingway. 
uh, I can't remember her first name, but um, okay. so it's uh, yeah, it's a theme. So is it a is it also a pedophilic attraction that he has that he was always born that way of being only attracted to children? Is it that it's that regressive type where because you know when you watch Manhattan you you clearly see that the way he wrote it the younger the woman the girl the child that he is in a relationship with is naive and doesn't know the world the way that Woody Allen does and kind of depends on like Woody Allen's almost like a dad to her you know like yeah. a mentor someone that knows how to navigate the world and is is that pedophilic or is that regressive in that it it he just feels safer with someone that doesn't understand the world very well and if he's with someone that understands the world really well he just feels scared because he just doesn't trust that they're gonna that they really love him and that they're really gonna stay with him right so, yeah. you know it, or both Anyway, let's take a break. When we get back, let's answer some questions from the listeners. What do you say on this topic, Berto? What do you say? Let's do it. So, Berto, before we get into the questions, I want to give a shout out to some of our older... What, what were we, oh, we were going to call us? The OPs. The OPs. And, and they gave us the word. It's uh, old patron prizes. Old patron, old patron. Pri Who gave us that? Uh, was that something? Uh, it was that? on, it, it was a comment. Oh, so I see you don't like me reading comments on YouTube. Well, it was a comment on YouTube. Oh, okay. Right. So last time we were debating what to call us. And so you said OPPs and it is the old patron prizes for today. We are going back to November, 2015. These five people have been patrons of the podcast for almost six years. We have Joan from Minneapolis. We have Tina uh, that doesn't, I don't know where Tina is from. We have Joanna from Birmingham, 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 Great Britain. Birmingham, 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 Birmingham. But you know how they always sort of blend the, the syllables together, you know, like <laughs> Worcester and anyway. Oh, yeah. We have Kat from Coppell, Texas. And we have Nick from Seattle. We, we met Nick at our live event do you remember we met nick and yes. nick's nick's mother i believe and nick was super great really great person so those are our opps for today OPPs. nice okay and by the way it was nelson 99 was the commenter all right well nelson <laughs> you and birdo effectively named the opps uh segment all right so getting back to my notes here so Discord, I want to thank the Discord. So Discord, if you don't know, and you can click the link below to join Discord, is a forum where all the fans will talk. If when you join our particular server, we'll we'll talk about various things, you know, mainly focused on the podcast. And we have a bunch of moderators who we're calling Discord Guardians. And Zach uh, compiled. I, I asked Zach to ask the Discord people questions on the documentary and they submitted these questions and thank you to the guardians particularly zach lola on discord says how sketchy was the assessment with dylan while determining that she was lying the whole oh thing seemed corrupt the file notes were destroyed they actually said she was lying which no one could ever be 100 percent uh sure of and then they weren't able to ever after then then they weren't available ever after the report came out to explain why the notes were destroyed Berto, what do you think yeah okay so my my journey by the way i kept thinking that i was so convinced so early on on the on this documentary that that it was so clear that i kept thinking no no this has got to be one of those documentaries where in the fourth episode they it turns around and, and it's like everything we thought we knew was wrong. And I kept waiting. I'm like, how is this going to pull back from this nosedive? And of course it never does. But in that part, I was like, okay, that's, that's it. I mean, this is ridiculous. They, they, okay. They come out and they do a press briefing with the accused. Okay. Number one, second with the accused, the accused uh, victimizer, right? Se second, like the, the fact that they none, none of them can testify. 
None of them can testify. The evidence, oh, it's, it's gone. It's all, the, all the notes are gone. And the language they use, it's just like, oh, and the, the nine hours or whatever of but why, questioning. But why would they do that? I mean, what? They're, it seems they're, like he must have known the, he must have known someone that knew someone or, or knew the head of the department or something. Okay, okay. Because yeah. like that seems so corrupt on its face. Yeah, I had the same reaction. Of course, the documentary is laying out in a certain way. Uh, so yeah, they said that she was lying. And the first thing that I, and, and, and they quoted the report, it said she was lying. Uh, no one I know of, so I'm trained in psychological assessments and forensics. I actually m minored, so to speak, in forensic psychology. And these kinds of not only assessments, but how do you report it? You know, it's a, a big part of forensic psychology is how do you testify in court? How do you write up the report such that it has integrity and it will follow ethical and legal standards? You know, it you don't just say stuff like, well, it's, I think that, you know, that the statement of a that you would make as a forensic psychologist, that child is lying about being sexually abused is quite a statement that yeah. that for me and the people I worked with, you know, I, I don't know about others would never say that we would, how would we possibly know if a child was lying about it or not? It, it, so at the very best or at the very most, we could say it, it seems possible that the child is lying based on the following evidence, but you could never say, I know the child is lying. No one knows yeah. that <laughs> because uh, uh, let's say that the child even says, even admits, which I don't think Dylan ever did, I was lying. Well, if the child said it to begin with, and now they're saying they're lying, are they being coached to say they're lying? Are they trying to retract it? Are they trying to get out of feeling like they're in trouble? Are they trying to get out of test? Are they trying to get out of coming to these multiple assessments? They don't, you know, they don't like being questioned this way. Uh, it, you just can't know that. And you also can't know if a child's telling the truth. So if a child is, you know, laying out all the details, you can't say like, I know this child is, you, you just, all you can do as a forensic psychologist is just lay out the data and provide like your opinion based on that data. But you would never say, I know the child is lying. Uh, now, uh, I've seen this before though, on some level with, not with this particular issue, but forensic psychologists, <laughs> this is why I didn't want to go into the field be is so <laughs> I would be, so I would be, I was getting trained by other forensic psychologists, you know, people that mm -hmm. work, work in the courts and, and we'd be going over the, you know, and I, when I was being trained as a psychologist, I, I'd already been a therapist and a professor for like 15 years. And so I wasn't just this naive student. I had written reports and assessed people. And, and so I would sometimes ask the forensic people, I'd say like, well, if a test in your interview, f you, you have this finding, uh, how do you know that you're actually accurate? And they didn't like those kinds of questions. They didn't, <laughs> you know, they said, well, the data shows blank. And I was saying, well, but how do you know for sure? I mean, you're, it, they seem deluded by their own instruments it, yeah. because, because they are hired to do a job. You know, their, their whole, the whole reason why they can pay their bills is because there's this notion out there that they know what they're doing. And if they were tentative, which is the reality that you should be, because how would you know, then they're basically saying there's no point in hiring me and right. there's no point in a lawyer hiring you because no lawyer wants to hire a forensic psychologist that says, well, there's no way to tell what a lawyer wants. The people who get hired is when you say one way or the other. And you'll see that. You'll see uh, uh, in cases in court, you'll see one psychologist saying the husband is an abuser and you'll see another psychologist saying the husband is absolutely not an abuser. And guess who hired, guess which lawyer hired the, you know, the forensic psychologist. Hmm. Well, it's it, so uh, you'll see this happen. And instead of uh, the two lawyers hiring different psychologists and both psychologists agreeing, we can't tell because how could we? <laughs> right. But, but here's the data. He said this, here's his psychological profile, which is mildly associated with abusing people. But of course, it's not a slam dunk. And some people lie. And, you know, he was a little shifty, but who knows? Like, they don't say that, usually. 
because you know that's not going to get you money right in, in no right in a, in a different lifetime so as you know i've been doing um quality control for uh eraser Erasers. heads yeah. for for my whole life almost but well as long as you've uh, been on the podcast you, you've done yeah that's true video. true true um but the thing is quality quality assurance is a is kind of a science in its own right right you, you have to like consider how do you verify that something is actually working correctly i used to have this interview question because you know i would hire people to do the quality assurance um of the erasers and i had this question where essentially it was like hey imagine you have this machine that is going to move along an infinite line in both directions um and it's gonna and the key is this this machine needs to put marks randomly along the line so it'll put a mark, then move randomly in one or the other direction, then put another mark, and then keep doing this forever. Infinite line, marks, forever. But there's one very important thing. It can never mark the same place twice, otherwise the universe ends. And so, of course, it's completely abstract, blah, 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 blah. But the reason I would ask this question is I'd say, like, how would, you know, the question would be, how would you test that this machine is working properly? I mean, you couldn't. And, Exactly. And that this is what I was always hoping that the, the more, you know, mature quality assurance folk would, would, would tell me that, you know, it's that question won't work and why. And then they would give me ways in which we could talk about, well, what's the actual expected reliability of the machine? How do we know the universe is going to end? And, and it would get, get very interesting. But there were a ton, sadly, of candidates that would say, well, I would run it for, you know, a uh, maybe run it for a few weeks and, you know like you're already losing like what are you doing but it's this kind of certainty running, running with, it for two uh measurements is you're already putting the universe at risk yeah exactly yeah. so but it's this kind of thinking that that we can know things in the universe right that is uh, arrogant but when you're talking about an infinite machine i sort of get it it might trip you up but then when you're talking about a child's mind yeah to to think that you know definitively yeah it's like wow <laughs> but we're talking about economics here i mean yeah. yeah money will cause politicians to do all sorts of stuff right yeah. money will cause us to look the other way when it comes to cigarettes or global warming or <laughs> the fact that i will not be able to uh, you know, the convenience of being able to drive to work, you know, we will look the other way. And Absolutely. when there's a ton of, and there is a ton of money in forensics, that was, that was the, the, often the, what was touted as like, well, you know, there's a lot of money in this <laughs> because you, you could charge a thousand dollars an hour for this kind of work. Right. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, it's, it's highly uh, expert and it, it takes a lot of time and you could have you could be a psychologist and still not qualified to do it. It, it probably takes five, ten years post grad before you can do it really on your own. Wow! And the ability to get up on the stand and uh, you know be able to respond to cross examination or expert witness uh, questioning by the opposing attorney. That's a whole other. You know, it's not just the ability. It's a whole set of skills that you have to be able to do and. And to do it well, or to not to do it well, to, to do it in a way that you'll get hired, you have to be, shall we say, arrogant. Now, I will also say that I know a lot of psychologists and forensic psychologists are listening right now. I know you're one of the good ones, so I'm not talking, <laughs> I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm just saying in my experience, and, and, the, and I guess I'll also say that even the good ones would kind of rub me wrong in terms of like my own career, <laughs> my own career choices, you know, because sure. even the good ones, eventually they would say to me like, well, at some point you got to say something, you know, it, it, you have to do, you, you got to do what you can and you got to say something because that's what you're being hired to do. And yes, there's a lot of ambiguity and there's a lot of variability there's a lot of chances that you're off base or you didn't get enough time to fully evaluate or the the individuals you're assessing are very good at tricking you you know we have a lot of ways of trying to eliminate those possibilities but at the end of the day yeah i mean but you but that doesn't mean you don't say anything you gotta say something well for me i was like well i i wouldn't want to say anything <laughs> i would want to yeah. go yeah i'd want to go to them and say like uh, I'm worried about saying anything to you because you'll take it as reality when I know that I don't know. 
<laughs> and, you know, that doesn't go over well in court, right? And lawyers are going to never hire you again. Anyway. I, so, I, by the way, I, sh I should have been a forensic psychologist because I would have been the opposite extreme. I would take one look at the situation and be like, yep, I've made my decision. I'm ready to testify. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, uh, so how this relates, again, getting back to what Lola was saying is, you know, this seeming corrupt assessment of Dylan, or at least problematic. Yeah, they said that she was lying. And although uh, uh, that might seem unusual, it, 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 it happens all the time. If you've been through a custody battle and you've seen both lawyers hire psychologists, <laughs> you will hear some wildly different <laughs> things um, in court. You know, one expert will say this. The other. And so this notion that psychologists are somehow objective all the time or uh, accurate is a bit of a, a, a deception that the industry, and again, I'm just hacking on forensic psychologists, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit, you know, it's sort of like the polygraph test. There's, there's plenty of people who have careers based on the fact that they are lie detectors. Well, these things don't work. Science has demonstrated polygraphs <laughs> are not accurate, they're not reliable at all. And, uh, but for a polygraph, and polygraph people have at least been exposed to that research. How are they supposed, what are they supposed to do? They've invested all this time and energy into becoming <laughs> that career. Are they supposed to just give it up? No, they have, a, they, they have to say that research wasn't, the methodology wasn't right, or I know better anecdotally, you know, like there's, there's anyway, my point is, is that it, I wasn't that surprised when in the documentary, it, they were like, how would they know? Anyway, the, now yeah. the destroyed notes thing is actually in the documentary, they were clearly saying there was something wrong with that. You know, one of another forensic psychologist or another a lawyer or someone was saying, you never destroy your notes. I'm, I'm not quite so sure about that. Um, I don't know the practices in that neck of the woods in that particular uh, activity. So let me explain a little bit. You're, you're talking with a child. So what they were saying in the documentary is there was, a, I think, a social worker, I believe, who was interviewing Dylan over nine sessions or something, which is unusual, by the way. You would, that, that part of it was strange, the, that you would need nine individual <laughs> sessions where the child from session one is saying, he touched me here, I touched him here. Oh, and then asking Dylan to repeat it over and over again in a seven-year-old, I believe she was seven. Anyway, that was also unusual and seems corrupt. At least it's a tick in the corrupt uh, column. But uh, the destroyed notes thing, it's it's debatable. So you're sitting down and you're evaluating, asking all these questions and you're taking notes as you're, as you're talking. Well, your notes might be completely discombobulated and very particular to you. Some people take notes that are kind of, you know, legible, and some people take notes that are very particular to them. And then when they are out of the evaluation, they'll they'll formally write up their notes or formally write up their findings. And then they'll discard their notes because their notes are so illegible that that it that wouldn't make any sense to keep their notes. So in the documentary, they were saying you would never get rid of your notes. Well, you would never get rid of your findings. You would never get rid of what you discovered, but you might discard your temporary notes in that process. Again, I don't know if, if no one did that in that realm, in that neck of the woods, but I wouldn't be surprised if some people destroy their notes. So I'm not quite so sure as to, you know, the slam dunk uh, accusation of a problem with that detail. But it was interesting that when the judge hearing the case of custody, uh, that the judge pointed out that, hey, the thing you've brought up from this agency has got all these problems. One of the problems he, li he or she listed was there's no notes. And I don't know if no notes means there were no recordings left or there were no, or the files, there's no files. Or, I don't know. It seemed to be like there was something that they were expecting, at least the, at the at the judge well, level. Well, okay. So here's the other thing that's a bit of a myth that judges know what they're talking about. I have <laughs> been I've been in court when judges have 
no idea what they're talking. Now, maybe that judge did know what they were talking about, but I just didn't have enough information. Like I would have to talk to the social worker that did the evaluation and say like, you know, what's your story? And if they said, well, I know it's not standard that we do it this way, but I always did it this way. I would take notes and then I would formally write my notes later. And those are still in the file, but my sort of haphazard notes, I always got rid of because they were nonsensical. <laughs> and uh, sometimes there was stuff on there that was a little speculative and I didn't want that in the final report that I, or the final notes that I included. I don't know if they would say that or if they, or if, you know, I just don't know. There's just, there's just too much variability in the practices that I've seen on that detail that I was like, uh, I don't know if that's as much of a slam dunk as, as they're portraying. Maybe it is in that neck of the woods, but it, it wouldn't be for me and the people in the assessments that I did. Anyway, the other, okay, so why, if something was wrong there, here are the speculations. So you've already speculated about one, that there's essentially fraud, that they had a back, you know, uh, back a, back deal. What? A press conference with the guy. Yeah, uh, but uh, would you is, do a press conference? You know, you're hired by a court to do something, and then you go and you do a press conference with one of the parties. It's certainly not uh, couth. It doesn't look good. But you know, if if you're wanting to advertise your agency as a viable assessment. Uh, you know, who knows? Uh, it it's it doesn't it doesn't look very professional, but yeah. you know, uh, uh, it happens. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it happens. You know, at least in part, sometimes. Anyway, so was it fraud? Could be. Was it bribery? Could be. Was it uh, backroom deals? Friends handshake deals? Could be. It also could just be incompetence. Don't underestimate the amount of incompetence in any field. Could the individuals who were doing the evaluation just have no idea what they're doing? Yeah, that happens all the time. This assumption that like, well, it's it's the Yale, D New Haven, da da da. It must be no. There, there's plenty of incompetence in the world. Who knows? I I don't know. Um, now another speculation I had while I was watching it was, was the organization that was assessing and the psychologists and and all the other people terrified of Woody Allen's lawyers suing them. You know, Woody Allen's lawyers were well-funded and very good. Mia Farrow's lawyers were not, <laughs> you know. Mia Farrow was basically just like, look, the truth will prevail. And Woody Allen was like, all guns ablaze with all my lawyers, right? Well, and not, not only that, I think in this case, the, um, that assessment, wasn't it ordered by the prosecutor? I don't remember. It yeah. probably was. It, I mean, that would I be the standard. So. That would be standard. And so, yeah. why? Why do you bring that up? Well, because it wasn't even... Um, why am I bringing that up? Oh, you, just to emphasize the point that, yeah, it, it's not like Mia had this crack team of Johnny Cochran's, you know? Right. It's like, she's there like, what are we going to do here? And then this, this uh, prosecutor is like trying to do their best and be like, well, we'll order this, we'll order that. And um, the right. prosecutor is so a state actor. Right. With a large caseload and not, yeah. not the funds, obviously, that uh, Woody Allen has thrown around. Right. It's similar with O.J. Simpson trial, for example. You are going up against people who have scores of assistants that can do all sorts of research. And, you know, anyway, so uh, would you maybe put pressure as Woody Allen's lawyers on the organization and say, hey, by the way, you know, I'm just going to throw it out here. If something you do is a little off kilter and we don't like the results, you better believe there's going to be a lawsuit and we're going to get you. So mm -hmm. watch what you're doing. And while the prosecutor isn't saying anything like that, right? Can we imagine that happening? Yeah. Or at least the implication, you know, it's all in the implication, right, Berto? Um, That's right. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, might that have happened? Or might the organization just been preemptively terrified of Woody Allen's lawyers? It, 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 there's a huge incentive there of like, if we sweep this under the rug, everything will go away and we can just go back to our regular jobs and not worrying about all the press conferences and, and losing jobs and scrutiny. And we, yeah. you know, and, whereas if we find Woody Allen to be maybe guilty and Dylan to be maybe telling the truth, then this will get, this will become a protracted legal problem for the next seven years of our lives. Do we really want that? 
you know, I, I've seen people make decisions in my field influenced by those factors. Also, bias for Woody Allen because he was famous. At that time, uh, he was a beloved figure, a very... Uh, it's hard. People who might be a little younger might not remember or might not know, but Woody Allen was just a huge figure in the 70s and 80s and 90s, particularly 70s and 80s. I mean, just a gigantic figure. And uh, it wouldn't be unusual for people to be kind of starstruck and just like, he wouldn't do that. He's he's a nice guy, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, oh, by the way, um, it reminds me, there was that moment where he's being interviewed and he says... Look, the whole thing doesn't make sense. I'm 57. Why would I choose this time of my life to all of a sudden become a pedophile? Right. So actually, Lola asked about that. Uh, Lola said, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Then is it, uh, what, let's see. The doc. Wait. Da, da, da. What did it do? Oh, I'm reading all the different <laughs> questions that... Uh, well, anyway, Lola brought that point up. Um, and... Yeah, the that's a misnomer that yeah, people a... <laughs> people can't do that. I mean, one, um, you could hide your pedophilia until you're in your fifties. <laughs> uh, two, you could uh, uh, be either hiding it by not acting on it or hiding your victims, hiding your victimization of others. Also, some people do develop personality changes later in life. Um, I, there's actually, and this isn't, you know, the same thing, but there's a medication that you can take for, um, for epi, you know, for, um, Parkinson's that can, in some people create compulsions. It's usually gambling, but it sometimes can be sex and it sometimes can be child abuse. Oh. Uh, so now there's debate as to whether or not they always had it in them, you know, but when you change the chemistry of the brain, we've known that, or you have a stroke, for example, or surgery, there was a case that was in a podcast, I think This American Life, a long time ago, where this guy had surgery on his brain, and after, because he, he had, I think, maybe, I can't remember why, but they took out a portion of his brain, and he was doing pretty well afterwards, but he found himself just in massive compulsion to abuse children sexually. Oh, I, I remember seeing a video about this. Yeah. And now you could debate, you know, was he just hiding it before and now he can't, you know, who knows? But anyway, the point is, is that this notion of why that, that all abusers who are caught when they're 55 have a known track record <laughs> going back to when they were 20 years old is, uh, you know, obviously silly. So, right? T to me, when he said that, I was like, oh my gosh, that makes you look more guilty in my mind. Because it's a, it's, a, it, it's a total straw man argument he's setting up, right? No one actually said, it's not like Mia or anyone else said, what we believe is that all of a sudden, Woody Allen developed in, in his 50s pedophilic tendencies. That, that's, not the, that's not the argument. I don't care how long, how soon, whatever. No one's bringing it up. You're bringing it up as like, oh, you see, like it doesn't make sense from this angle. It's almost, it's one thing if I said, uh, let's say you, you accuse me of like, hey man, um, I, think, I think you're probably a robber, like you steal things. Um, and I say, well, look, I have been alive for 46 years. Uh, I've certainly never been accused or convicted of stealing things. So what is your evidence? Okay, fine. But imagine that all of a sudden you're like, hey, I saw you eating vanilla ice cream the other day. And I go, wait, um, why would I be, choose to wait till I'm 46 to like vanilla ice cream? Liking things is not something you can prove what I did or didn't. So it's like, who is to know what he predilected, what he has done in secret, what he wanted to do? It's just ridiculous. So I think him bringing that up, if... if someone was uh really innocent i would have not expected that statement i would have expected the statements like no absolutely this didn't happen no of course not da, 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 da. totally of course i expect those statements but i would not expect these weird straw man arguments like why would i do that in when i'm 57 it, it's just it, it struck me as really odd yeah well on the other hand if you're accused of something like that and you have no hard evidence that you did it or that you didn't do it then 
you're going to have to resort to circumstantial questionable evidence. You know, if, if he had the definitive proof that he didn't do it, he would obviously present that if he didn't do it. Right. So, so, so in that sense, I would expect things like, Hey, look, I've been around all the following sets of children at all those various ranges of their life. Let's go interview all these people yeah. and they will give you accounts. And, and look and at my he, dating pattern. Look at my this, look at my this, look at my this. Circumstantial, I, I, circumstantial. And I think, well, I don't think he worded it that way, but I, I, I'm pretty sure he does point those things out, you know? But I, w- I would say like, well, no, that's what we're doing. And actually it's looking pretty weird because you've now dated, started having sex with an underage girl and then married right. her. Who, and then yeah. you were dating another underage girl. You write movies about it. And like, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. what? Yeah. But not not definitive proof other than Dylan's sure, of account. Course. Um, now, what Lola on Discord also asked, what, what would a psychologist look for in a case suspected of false allegations or implanting false memories as Mia was accused of doing to Dylan? Does this case have or have not those markers and how clearly does it not have or have such markers? So, uh, yeah, I don't know because I don't have access to the reports or the evaluations, so uh, I can't know in the case of Dylan. They talked briefly about it in the documentary, but, you know, these kinds of evaluations are pretty complicated. But the things that uh, we tend – and this I don't do this kind of work. Uh, I've done it in the past, and I've worked alongside a lot of people, so I'm just speaking from that place. But the sort of things that you're looking for when you're e- evaluating a situation like this as a psychologist are – you're you're doing a full or as much of a full evaluation of the child as possible not just the issue of the events that are being discussed but what's you know what's their personality like how mature are they what are their general morals do they have any attachment problems what's do they have ADHD do they have early bipolar do they um you know are they uh, what how are their emotional expressions are they generally stable? Do they generally tell the truth in session? What are the reports by other people? You're trying to piece together a psychological profile that is inherently circumstantial, but can inform the uh, powers that you know the 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 people that are making the decision as to whether or not it's the you know the person's innocent or guilty or telling the truth. Um, you know, for example with Dylan, they were looking into how consistent her story was. And apparently they had to ask her nine different times, which is unusual, or nine different sessions, probably several times, but they probably asked her a hundred times. So you're, and so not only would a lawyer do this, but a psychologist might as well, just, just kind of, you know, can you tell this story again? And if it, if it changes wildly, because the, the thing is, is that when a child is making something up, then it will morph over time sometimes but when you're dealing with children one they will morph things over time just kind of naturally and two if you keep asking them the same question over and over again even an adult they might perceive i must not be answering the question quite right and this can actually go two different ways you can you can either cause a victim to recant their story when they shouldn't be or you can cause someone that isn't a victim to believe they were a victim. You know, these are the implanted memories where y- you ask a child, you know, were you abused? And the child says, no. And you say, well, are you sure you weren't abused? And the child says, what do you mean? Well, did, you know, where did he touch you on this doll? Where did he touch you? And the child says, um, uh, he didn't touch me. And then you say, are you sure he didn't touch you? And so this is a case where the child wasn't abused. Are you sure that he didn't touch you? And the child's like, um, yes. And then you bring him in next week. He's like, so where did he touch you on the doll? Uh, I don't know. What do you, he touched me here. And the kid's just like, I don't know what, I don't know what you're asking. And the kid just points at like the head. Oh, so <laughs> he did. So he did touch you. And the child's like, oh crap. I just, I just said that he touched me. Um, because I was just, I just wanted to play. I just, I didn't want to be asked these questions anymore. So crap, I just sort of, you know, and you're, you're seven, you don't know how to answer. And so, you're, oh, yeah, yeah, he touched me on that. Okay. So, so last week you were lying to me when you said he didn't touch you. Is that right? And the kid's like, fuck, what do I say? <laughs> you know, kids say all sorts of shit. So the kid's like, um, yeah, I was lying last week. Yeah. 
and the kids is like, can we just move on so I can play Legos with you? Or something? I don't want to answer these questions here. And you say, okay, well, where else did he touch you? And the kid's like, oh, so I'm su- is that what I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to say that he touched me other places? Okay, fine. He touched me on the butt, you know. And you keep doing this over and over again. And eventually the kid uh, uh, will believe that they were being touched in that way. And you can actually, again, do this to adults as well. We've shown this through lots of research. Our memories are extremely malleable. We are not tape recorders. We are not hard disk drives. We are... We're not YouTube videos. <laughs> we are not YouTube videos. We are... Uh, we, you know, the thing I always say is, have you ever seen a brain? <laughs> it does not look like a hard drive. It looks like a pile of mud, you know? Uh, and so the fact that that pile of mud isn't precise should not surprise you. So... Um, I mean, the fact that you forget where your keys are sometimes uh, should alert you to the fact that your brain isn't exactly precise in its ability to remember things and remember that you didn't remember things. Anyway, so it can go both ways. And um, so you have to be extremely careful as an evaluator that you're not implanting memories, you're not changing memories, and it's really hard to know. And you can never really know because a kid will say lots of things, especially under that circumstance, because the kid isn't comfortable usually. The kid knows that it's there's awkwardness in the air. There's like, why am I here? And you usually try to play games at first and make the kid feel comfortable, but there's always discomfort. You know, the kid would rather yeah. be home playing games or something. And so that puts a lot of pressure. And so there's a lot of, but anyway, the, the kinds of things you're looking for are consistency. You might look for a tendency to be fantastical or to make stuff up. And that was their contention was that Dylan had a pattern of making th- making up stories that she, you know, when they just asked her about other kinds of things, she would include details that were clearly not possible. Like she would talk about, I don't know, spaceships or something. And you would say, oh, she generally lives in a fantasy world. And so thus, how can we trust what she's saying? Now, you wouldn't say she's lying. <laughs> right. <laughs> Someone with a active or overly active fantasy orientation can still be abused and tell the truth. It's not like every single thing that comes out of Dylan's mouth is a fantasy. We all understand that. So, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so that's how I'll answer that question. I could go on and there's a whole system of how to evaluate this in kids, but just know that it's it's hard and you, you look for certain uh, markers, you mark it down, you write it in your report, and you give an opinion of just like, well, it's it's in my experience, it's possible. That, that would have been much more of a common response that I have seen is something like, given the pattern and these five factors that I observed, here's my data, it seems quite likely or possible that she was abused or it seems quite possible that she is making it up but i can't know for sure that kind of thing yeah um all right so evan i'm just going to rattle off the evidence for and against uh that i compiled and i'm not an expert on this but this is what i compiled so the evidence that he did it and this is from not just the documentary but from other sources um evidence that woody allen did it dylan farrow has consistently told the child since childhood Usually this indicates the truth and she has almost nothing to gain and a lot to lose. So as with most cases like this, not only is it likely that Dylan is telling the truth, but we almost have a moral duty to believe her. Why would, why would we disbelieve her? It basically comes down between Woody's word and Dylan's word. And why would Dylan want to ruin Woody Allen's, you know, there's no reason why she would, especially now, you know, uh, the only reason why she would come forward is if she's like, there's something, there's an injustice here, something's wrong. And, and uh, I want the world to be right. And, and so I'm willing to incur all the hatred and all the denial and all the re-traumatization to make the world right. You know, that's usually what's happening. Yeah. The other reason why we would say that he did it is that Dylan, in the documentary, she had a real classic PTSD reaction when she was recalling the story. Do you remember that moment, Berto? Oh, yes. Yeah. It was, oh, it was brutal. Yeah, that's hard to fake. And it's possible she was faking it. It's possible that she was reacting to an implanted memory. But 
it, it, it's much more likely that that physiological reaction was absolutely a reaction to the trauma, not just the sexual trauma, but the emotional coercion trauma that she went because you know it wasn't just that he sexually abused her it was that he uh, dominated her 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 life and her body and her brain at, not just sexually but just in general and they had footage of that you know all that yeah. one in one time and that was traumatizing for her and you saw her have a very classic ptsd reaction and i feel like all with all the reality tv i've been watching lately i've gotten or at least I believe <laughs> that I've I've become a little bit of a uh, I have a little bit of a skill that's developed over the past couple of years of detecting faking of affect on television, you know, because it obviously yeah. serves some people to do that, and it didn't ring any of those bells. Could she be faking? Yeah, absolutely, but it didn't look like it to me. Um, Woody Allen admits to having a relationship with one of the other children, Soon Yi. <laughs> So, yeah, it's like uh, it, it. It's not a, a a crazy accusation at that point. It's like, well, we have a pattern here of yeah. you having sex with your stepchildren or children. Uh, uh, so, and with witnesses <laughs> talking about that that was potentially happening before she was even a, a, of age. Right. Yeah. I mean, the chance that. It was, it started when they say it started, especially with how much they were hanging out. Yeah. Uh, it seemed, I mean, let's just even say that it's true, that they never had sex before she was 21, which I think is their account of it. Well, they were hanging out a lot when she was a teenager. Yep. So at the very least, it's, you know, um, even retrospectively, <laughs> Anyway, point is, is it that that's at least quote unquote evidence that he, meaning circumstantial evidence that he did it because. And by, and by the way, not not to mention that, if we if we rewind the clock, um, the whole idea is that the reason why the accusation is not real is because uh, Mia Farrow w felt scorned by the uh, Sunni thing, right? right? And so then I I guess I would expect to see that Mia Farrow has been unable to move on from the Sunni devastation right and that her life really has revolved around that aspect yeah and that that seems completely opposite to the reality right and she very much after the relationship ended you know before you know she had clearly a lot of romantic relationships you know some marry yep. some marriages and some not before Woody Allen after Woody Allen no relationships which is right. another tick in the column of Mia Farrow's telling the truth, because if it was truly a lie and a manipulation on Mia Farrow's part, why would she trick herself into believing that her child was abused such that she didn't ever want to take that risk again? You know, yeah. it, it just was extremely consistent with, if we believe the documentary that Mia after Woody Allen would be like, well, I let this man into my house and he abused my children. And I didn't, and I don't have the ability to make that detection. And so I guess I have to deny myself that need for the rest of my life. And I'm never going to date again, you know, right. and, that, and that's what she did. And it's not like any of the audio of the calls, which by the way, did I understand, didn't I understand, right? The audio we were hearing of the calls was taped by Woody Allen. No, oh, I don't know. That seemed to be the thing because he, that was what came out. And in fact, there's one call where she says, are you taping this? He's like, no, I don't even know how to use those things. And then the thing cuts out or he's like, oh, give me a second. And then it's a different call where he's talking maybe to his lawyer saying like, yeah, I'm recording right now. It's bizarre. But in those conversations, and maybe we didn't hear all of them, but certainly they didn't seem to revolve around Sun Yi and, but I want you back or I can't believe what you did to me. You right. know, it's all about her, about, um, the little girl. Well, and Mia pleading, pl Mia pleading with Woody Allen to not go to the media anymore. She's like, could yeah. you please not drag the kids through this? Yeah, just, exactly. Let's just keep it on the DL, you know? If you were truly a scorned lover, you would relish in the fact that this was in oh, the yeah. media, right? Yeah. Where it was seemingly, from the documentary, the opposite. Also, Mia just seems like a saint. <laughs> so yeah. she, I thought that too as I was watching it. I was like, 
oh my God, this person is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I literally, while I was watching it with my wife, exclaimed, she's a saint. <laughs> She, yeah. she's she's like uh, she's going if, around the world like yeah they, she's like helping the, with polio and yeah oh my god and and uh, to literally save the lives of children around the world and you know adopt them and bring them into a home now okay so now the evidence that he didn't do it let's go into this now he he claims he didn't do it okay that's evidence uh, it's not yep. fantastic evidence but it's it's you know evidence. well what I was saying is unlike Roman Polanski. Who's like he's not claiming no that didn't happen. He's just saying well it, it yes but it's not as bad as you think. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. Plus she was into it. <laughs> right. Now whatever we feel about that he's admitting it. <laughs> right. Um, he claims that uh, Dylan was coached. Um, that it does happen, particularly when there are custody battles, particularly when there are breakups. There is actually a a pretty high prevalence of it. Uh, and it's something that people don't often talk about when you are, you know, going through a real nasty divorce and you just hate your your ex spouse and you'll do anything to protect your kids. And whether it's a real threat or not, you believe that your ex is a bad parent, and you know, well, if I accuse my ex of sexual abuse, this whole problem will go away, and. It's for the better. So I'm going to tell little, you know, little Bobby, hey, you know, remember when daddy was in the pool with you that one time and he, he touched you down there and, it, and it, you know, in your head as a parent, you're like, I know it was accidental, but I could use this against it, you know. And so, so all we got to do is just get Bobby to say that he, you know, he was touched and I'm, I'm, I don't want to throw my ex into prison. I just want this custody battle to go away. And then you make the report and then forensic people start to show up and they ask you more questions and, and you start elaborating and then you, the, you know, you start actually kind of freaking out and you, you start pressuring Bobby to say a little bit more. And this happens, this happens. Is it the majority of cases where these come forward? No, but it, you know, it, it's a thing in custody battles. And did it seem like Mia Farrow was capable of that? No. Did it seem like that was even really a factor? What, you know, that because by the time Sunyi was, by the whole time this this problem was going on between Woody Allen and Mia Farrow, Sunyi was an adult. So that so there wasn't any power that Mia could have if if Sunyi wanted to be involved with Woody. Mia knew yep. that she couldn't do anything about that. So there wasn't seemingly anything at stake that Mia would be motivated to somehow tear him down in that way. But, you know, it can happen. And it seemed like the timing was first came the accusation about Dylan, which, by the way, um, she claims, Mia Farrow claims that she wasn't aware that the, that the therapist would have to report. Right? right. Like she, she sent Dylan to the therapist and then she wasn't aware that the therapist would have to report, but the therapist reported, and that's how the thing started. Right, and then the, then the, right, then the state prosecutor takes over. Exactly. Yeah. And then Woody Allen comes out and says, oh, I've got an announcement to make. Uh, I'm in love with Sun Yi, and that's why you're here. It wasn't like Woody Allen left Mia, the press gets a hold of it. Oh, what's happening? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm running away with Sun Yi. And then these accusations start coming up. Right. You have to wonder if that hadn't come out, would we, Woody Allen even have lasted with Sunyi? Or did he, does he need Sunyi as his like very weird alibi? Because it kind of works as an alibi in a sense in terms of his yeah. scrapped together narrative that, it, that, that Mia Farrow was upset, you know? Yeah. And I just remember in the 90s, it, people saying, you know, you know, Woody Allen's, uh, he's he's dating his daughter, and then other people said, "No, it's not really his daughter. It's it's the it's the adopted daughter of yeah. his ex girlfriend." You know, right, it, right. it was always sort of said that way. And and I remember that. that. I remember thinking, "Okay, I guess that's all right." Right. He's not related to the child. Uh, it it's kind of a distant. You know, in 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 your head, the way it was portrayed, it was like it'd be like Birdo if you had an ex girlfriend from like 15 years ago and she had a, an adult adopted daughter and you just happened to fall in love with that you you know you just right. randomly bumped into this woman at a party and then oh you're 
you're the adopted daughter of my ex from 15 years ago, but we fell in love. What are we going to do? Oh, well, this kind of looks weird. That's the way it was portrayed. That's not how it was. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> he uh, was he, there the whole time. He right. even called out, even in his own words, I found something very interesting from, from the moment that she came into the family, like right. when she was 10, basically. Right. Yeah, as a child. And Yeah, no, totally. It's just not consistent. He was, I mean, he was, uh, you know, uh, at the very least, a father figure, you know, say like a like a friend of the family as a father figure to Sun Yi. Right. And uh, quite possibly, you could make the argument, a stepfather, which is a father. And uh, whether Sun Yi saw him that way or not, I don't know. But, you know, the, the documentary and all the home footage, it, it just shows it, you know, yeah. that he, he was over there. He was, it's particularly with Dylan, right? He... <laughs> If he wasn't Dylan's father, what was he? Or if he wasn't right. Dylan's essential father figure, what was he? Right. So, right. It, it, if he was just like a friend of the family, it's then why was he uncle? <laughs> yeah. Uh, then and Sunyi was a sibling of Dylan's. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, like Ronan Farrow, you know, one of the kids that you know he he's spoken out about this. He'll be like, yeah, Sunyi is both my sister and my and my stepmother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. <clears throat> but anyway, so now, again, evidence against that people will say is the accusers and the documentarians are accusing him for personal gain, you know, fame, money. Dylan doesn't seem like she's interested in those things, but, uh, you know, those are the accusations, uh, possible motivation. I, the Michael Jackson supporters will definitely point to that as a reason why the right. fame and money is the reason why they, they would accuse. Um, one of the adopted children said that he never did it, uh, but that claim seemed extremely dubious given that the other <laughs> child, I think it was Moses, was like nine years old himself at the time. And looking back, he's like, no, it never happens. Like, how would he know? But, you know. He well, and he actually, at first he believed and he, he wrote a, a letter right. saying how he felt betrayed and then he recanted it. Yeah. But I mean, I, and I'm not blaming him, like poor no. little kid also yeah. traumatized. Right. Uh, traumatized in his own way. He had yeah. this father figure, a hero of his, Yeah. and then he feels betrayed. And then he loves the guy though. Yeah. So he's like, wait, no, this can't be. And I'm sure they've had all sorts of conversations. And Woody Allen, like, look, if I hadn't watched this and I'm just having a conversation, the guy sounds really convincing. That's his... His skill, his shtick is he can, you know, do all this little talking and then, and then why would this happen? Like, and all of a sudden you're going along with this little convoluted train of thought and you're watching his movie and you're thinking, wow, yeah, I, I kind of see his points. And right. there you are. Yeah. And so the guy can be super convincing. Imagine if you're a kid, imagine if you grew up thinking yeah. of him as a father. Yeah. Even if he wasn't convincing, you know, when you are in a, and many of you out there might have been in a situation like this and Berto, you not precisely, but you had a, a similar kind of, uh, environment of I have a choice right now given what I'm experiencing I can either go with what everyone else is saying and essentially lose a parent which I don't want it's just terrible I'm, I'm essentially like self-abandoning <laughs> myself <laughs> I'm, I'm, or I can go into denial and yeah just believe that it's not true so that I can have a parent you know I yeah it, we will do a lot of things uh, yep. Far more sacrificial to retain a parental relationship than that, and so totally. uh, is that possible? Yeah, you know. But is he telling the truth? You know, does he have uh, Sun Yi also defends Woody Allen? Uh, but again, how would she know about behind the scenes Dylan situation? There's claims that Mia Farrow was abusive. Uh, that's not evidence that Woody Allen was innocent, but it does indicate character issues similar to Woody Allen's character being called into question. Uh, those. Accusations are, you know, hotly debated in their own Not family. Not only that, dude, if that was the case, then why the hell did Woody Allen never mention that? Or why didn't he care? Didn't he care so much about uh, the, the, the boy? What, what's his name? Moses. Didn't he care? Moses. Didn't he care? So didn't he see any of this? How yeah. come he didn't see any of this abuse happening? Why didn't he step in? Why isn't he? Anyways, it's. Yeah. Uh, the w Woody Allen was investigated by the Yale New Haven Hospital Sexual Abuse Clinic, and they 
quote said, it is our opinion that Dylan was not sexually molested by Mr. Allen. Again, how would they know that? But that was their opinion. We, we don't have access to the data. Woody Allen was investigated by the New York State Department of Social Services and quote, no credible evidence was found that the child named in this report has been abused or maltreated. And unquote, again, how would they know that? But we don't know how they came to that conclusion. So a lot of experts both saying Dylan was not abused and Woody Allen is not an abuser. Again, how would they know that? But <laughs> they, they claim that we don't have access to those, that, those data. Uh, doctors examined Dylan and found no evidence of abuse. Uh, that's uh, evidence, you know, for the people that are pro Woody Allen, they'll point to that. But that's not unusual because what physical, you know, a physician examining Dylan, what evidence, you know, there are signs which i won't go into for you know the graphical nature of it of abuse happening to someone but the fact that there isn't evidence doesn't mean it didn't happen right especially because the description of what was uh done to her which right. i again won't mention would wouldn't leave any kind of injury exactly or it, yeah. should, it should, probably wouldn't and oh by the way this is another reason why Oh, it it is so difficult. But as I was listening to it, I'm like, well, look, if they were gonna fabricate something, like you right. would imagine it would be even worse, right? Right. right. Yeah. That wasn't actually. That's a good point, Berto. Uh, I thought the same thing. Of when people fabricate, not always, because sometimes they're trying to, you know, keep it, especially in a case when when they're trying to deal with a custody thing like because the way i portray role play that one person they're just like i just want i just want this to go away i don't want to cause a big uproar i just i just want to use a little bit of a influence here to kind of push this person away so i'll kind of intimate so, so there's situations like that but often when there are false reports it gets pretty fantastical you know because it's like well if i'm gonna lie i'm gonna really go for it and and even as an adult you might say like well I'm going to really go for it because I don't want there to be any, any ambiguity as to whether or not something happened. But the story remained, although definitively abusive, fairly non-sensational, right? And, and look, look at, okay, so let's use the logic, right? Like we were saying, hey, why would I have 57? Okay, well, let's take it this other way. So imagine Mia Farrow sitting there talking to, I guess, the babysitter going, Hey, can I get you to say that? Um, let's see, what could we make up? Oh, I right, get it. Right. He had his head in her lap. Wait, right. what? Like doing what? No, no, just there. Like just kind of, uh, I guess, breathing in and out. Wait, what? Who does that? What? What are you well, talking that, about? That one wasn't <laughs> as definitive or that uh, wasn't as sort of as much evidence as I think one of the friends of the family saw the two of them in bed naked or something oh, absolutely no but I'm, I'm using the other one as evidence of like what why would you make that up right because the thing is that if you don't actually have some sort of weird well okay i, I don't want to use these kind of terms but if you don't have some patterns that are maybe unusual uh then you probably wouldn't put your head in the lap of a seven-year-old and breathe in and out like what the n naked like like okay but would Mia Farrow make that? Like, now I'm now I'm really questioning the logic. So I would expect things like, you know, the made-up story would check out. The logic would check out. Like, oh yeah, you know, he put his finger in her. Okay, fair enough. Blah blah. But th th these other things, I'm like, wait, what? And that that's the kind of thing that I actually that points to. Okay, there are some very 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 difficult attachment and psychological issues that are going on with him where he actually feels connected to her by doing something that almost isn't sexual in nature except it kind of is in this bizarre way right yeah and and we don't know the full extent of the because they actually didn't describe it right. i think for reasons um, that i think have to do with maybe dylan's desire for at least some privacy and also her PTSD. Actually, just a side note, when I saw her have the PTSD reaction, I, I thought, is she getting proper treatment? Because if, if, if I was treating someone like her, I would tell her, look, until you are habituated sufficiently to these stories, you can't talk about them in a documentary. You shouldn't even be thinking about them because you're going to harm yourself. And we, you saw that harm happen during the documentary. I, I think she was told that. I think she talked about being told that. And she said, because remember, uh, there was a moment in which she said, that she was advised by her therapist not to bring this back up and not oh, to get re-traumatized. Uh, well, you, you watched it much with much more 
like attention <laughs> than I did. <laughs> Maybe because it, it, no pun intended, it touched me deeply. You know, it was like how so? It, you know, it's like kid traumatization, which I went through. So it's just uh, I was sitting there thinking. Um, just a lot of the same thoughts we've talked about before, man, these little kids, you know, I was five. She was probably, I don't know how soon it started. She was at least seven and you, you don't know what's up. You don't know what the world is. You don't, and all of a sudden you're confronted with something. And you know how she was talking about how she felt so guilty for a long time thinking like, why, why do I feel abused? Like clearly nothing that bad happened to me because I hear these other horror stories that are way worse. So what right do I have to feel? And I could relate to that because I, th I think I've mentioned that for the longest time, I didn't even think it was abuse at all. I thought, in fact, I used to think it was sort of kind of cool that that had happened to me up until my probably 19 or 20. I felt that way. I felt like, oh, well, no, that was a cool thing that happened to me. Right. It certainly never would have been like, oh, woe is me. I was a victim. And, you know, because I had no idea the trauma and damage that it was going to cause, you know? Yeah. 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 When we are in a vacuum and we have a society that denies the notions that would help a child. You know, when, it, when a child is being bullied at school, we, there's messages of there are bullies in the world. There are shows on... Hannah Montana, for example, <laughs> episodes about bullying. There's maybe even an anti-bullying campaign at school where you watch a video or something. And you're given at least a chance to understand that as a victim of bullying, that it's not your fault. When it comes to this sort of thing, we, you know, we're so busted up about sexuality that we either have minimal education or exposure or we flat out give messages to everyone that if there's any sexual involvement or activity that there's something extremely shameful about it and there's something seriously wrong with you so yeah. all these victims including yourself walking around because if you had been pushed down the stairs by your babysitter you knew that you could run to your father and say she pushed me down the stairs yeah. but yes. when she does this sort of thing to you you're like what do i what am i supposed to do i, I i'm pretty sure i'm not supposed to tell anyone because right i'm pretty sure this is naughty stuff that you're not supposed to tell your parents and no one seems to be talking about this sort of thing. So I guess I'm just not going to talk about it. And then you have to make up a story in your mind to cope, which is it was cool rather than yeah, exactly. uh, admitting the what it you know, also felt. I mean, it did feel like that. It did feel cool to you, but it also felt. It, it didn't. It, not, not at all. Like oh. the actual situation of it, because I still have the pictures in my mind. And it never felt good. It never felt right. It always confused me. Yeah. It felt gross. Mm. And I never understood what was happening. Mm. But the surrounding halo around it was, oh, cool. I'm, that's, she likes me. That's the line I'm, she gave you. That's the vibe she gave you. Yeah. You're, and well, and I, had, I looked up to her. I, I, I thought, you know, I thought she was pretty. She was older. She was, she, she was cool. So I'm like. Oh, this is cool. I, she likes me, and and that must mean we could be boyfriend girlfriend or something. I mean, I, now I'm adding words, but it's like this sense of oh, and I'm in a secret club. And, but the the actual flashes I have, and I don't mean just like me interpreting them now as an adult. I mean, I remember the 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 feelings and thoughts in some of those moments, and it was just confusing, like. Why am I doing what it what what is that like yeah it never made sense it was never like yeah that was not it it's just everything surrounding it was like oh cool yeah it's secret cool i'm in the club yeah it's heartbreaking to think about you going through that little little birdo a little 5 year old birdo yeah man and so then i was sitting there watching and it must have been similar for Dylan where she's going what is going on? Oh, but I guess this is daddy time. In fact, she said, like, maybe this is what daddies do, you know? Right, yeah. She said she went over to some other uh, friend's house. Yeah. And she was like, your dad doesn't, like, just glom onto you? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I thought that's what dads did. That's what daddies do. Like, your dad just watches TV and doesn't bother you? Like, I didn't know that daddies were like that. Yeah, it's yeah. just heartbreaking 
to, to hear her talk about that. And right, it, all the lines of evidence, right, that line of evidence, the observational evidence, the video evidence, like it all, it, you know, builds this pretty solid uh, picture of the conceptualization that I was saying, where it was just complete obsession with her. And anyway, final question, Berto. Should we be able to watch his movies? I got to be honest, man. I uh, was looking for reasons early in the documentary. I'm like, well, I can probably... by the time I was done, I because I, 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 I'll tell you why. It's see with Michael Jackson, maybe you know what? It, who knows? But I'll tell you what. I was thinking, okay, what he did was terrible, and how traumatic to that little girl. Uh, but I could, in some way, still feel empathy for the guy if I knew well he was abused too, or he had these traumatic things, and then he ended up, you know, coming out and saying, "Yeah, this happened," and now he's in treatment and stuff. And like, I would feel for him somewhat, you know. But it's the opposite. If if this happened, then he's a monster because he has. It's not just that he did that. Is that he's turned this whole family into a mess and accused like the mom of the worst things and taken his step and her step her daughter and married her and like the right. whole thing right makes he, him a monster right so if he let's say he did it there are various different ways he could have tried to extract himself or protect himself but he decided to attack mia yeah psychopathically at, dude Right. He could have just said, look, it didn't happen. I don't know why Mia's saying it. It didn't happen. You know, he could have just, and he probably still would have gotten out of it, but he didn't do that. He systematically, and they portray this in documentary. We don't know the accuracy, but it seemed that there's evidence that he actually told Mia, no, I'm not going to go to the press. And then he went to the press, you know, let's not go to the press. And then he goes to the press. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. Well, so now if I, if I'm wrong, if the documentary is biased and this was the thing, and it turns out this is all one big mind game and everything. Well, apologies to Mr. Allen. But if I am to believe the data in front of me, which seems compelling, then F him, man. I'm done. I, I will not miss it because now every time I watch one of his stupid movies, I'm going to sit there seeing that abuse happening. Yeah. And it's even worse in the sense because like, you know, I, I, I've told you, I think, that there are now some Michael Jackson songs that I can't listen to without getting creeped out. But there are some where I still kind of turn... Pretty young like, thing. Yeah, but there are some that I still look the other way because I guess their songs are so freaking good. But I don't have to, like, look at someone doing things that are basically kind of creepy in the first place. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 maybe it's too soon, but I felt towards the end of that documentary, I was like, I'm done. I, yeah. I believe this, yeah. and I'm done. I mean, I was, I was still trying to evaluate that, but hearing you talk about it, yeah, I mean, I see that. I, 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 I'm convinced by your, by your take on that. It, it makes no sense. Heartbreaking. Yeah, if you really just think, I mean, you just really have to think. Okay, what if, if he did it? Which it seems like he did. He's a monster, and. How can you watch his face in a movie? Now, he's not in all of his movies. So what about some what about the movies where he's not in it? You know, like Midnight in Paris with Owen Wilson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you watch that movie? Or is it or is the the man <sighs> I, behind I it? I don't uh, know. I, I, I that's those are always great questions. It's hard. I will say this. Uh, once again, and, and I don't want this to sound wrong. It's just the actual, I'm not bothered by the acts, because even though the acts are horrible and poor little girl and all these things, I'm like, well, if, if that had come out and he had like fessed, uh, fessed up and really embraced the fact that he's damaged and that he needed help and then apologized and it's not like it excuses it. He probably would have still should have served time, done whatever, right? But since not only did that not happen, but it was the extreme opposite. That's where I have to leave that short. But as far as like movies that he wrote or whatever, that I don't know. I I don't know. I just can't look at him right now. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't talked about this yet, but I feel like it's important for me to say that I am a 
I was or am a huge Woody Allen movie fan. I, I in my office at Antioch, I had very different posters, and you could guess some of them. There, mm-hmm. There's a Star Wars poster. There's a, a Clockwork Orange poster. There's a, a Logan's Run poster and an Annie Hall poster, Big yeah. Lebowski poster. Yeah. Annie Hall was had a huge effect on me when I was a kid, when I saw it. I, I had there have been so many copycats of Annie Hall, but yeah. it was the first of its kind. You know, it, almost every rom-com you've ever seen has its roots in that movie. Mo- any movie that's, or any TV show that's about just youngish 20, 30 something people that don't have kids living their lives, you know, yeah. uh, uh, just the, the scenes that Woody Allen wrote and created and, Diane Keaton and the vibe of it is it, it holds up today. You, you watch Annie Hall today. It's still good. And the, and it was made in 1977 when yeah. a lot of crappy movies were being made, you know, now the seventies were kind of a golden era of movies, but in terms of rom-coms and those kinds of movies, you'd be hard pressed to find a movie that even comes close to Annie Hall. Maybe, yeah. uh, you know, um, the graduate, but these are very particular movies, you know, and incredible talent. And then the next year, he makes Interiors, which is a complete departure from Annie Hall. Interiors is a very depressing movie about a enmeshed family. And when I saw this movie in my 20s, it deeply affected. It's one of the lesser known movies. But if, if you're interested in a just a and, and the, the cinema, it gives me chills. The cinema talk. So in Annie Hall, you don't think of cinematography. You think of acting. You think of writing. You think of storytelling. You think of humor. You think of rom-com stuff interiors is a completely different style of movie that was you know the true auteur and someone who could make a you know christopher nolan makes a movie every five years woody allen makes a movie every nine months it's crazy (laughs) and half of them are are genius movies you know what i mean considered you know to be or a third anyway could we take some solace some comfort in hoping that he had not yet become a monster at those ages well 1979 he makes manhattan (laughs) With yeah. Mariel, Mariel Hemingway, you know? Yeah. Uh, and... Okay, uh, but say, could we, again, I'm just, you know... He you hadn't know. done anything horrible well, to... Well, not only that, it, no, he was dating a 17-year-old, but, you know, right. different times, different mores, it, people actually kind of look sideways at those things, whatever. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you're looking for an excuse to be able to watch his movies, you know, I guess that's... I, I'm, more, I'm more, actually, what I'm thinking is, at which point in the history of a human being do we cut them off? Because clearly especially if you're a parent, right? Like imagine you're a parent of someone who became a psycho killer or something, right? But you still have those memories of them as a child. Well, you're a parent. It's completely different, right? Or, or the, maybe you're not a parent. Maybe you just knew, you, you were the preschool teacher of that, of that kid, that well, little so, kid. And so you you're saying these... like Woody Allen pre, you know, let's say there was a moment where he crossed the line with Dylan and that was the first time he'd ever done anything. We don't know that, but let's say that that was, so are you saying that Everything he made before that date is okay for us to watch, and everything after is not. Yeah, I'm, I'm more, I'm more making a mental point for myself about when do I start loathing this individual in their history? Do I go back to their very inception as a baby, or do I <laughs> pick a point in time? And I guess for me, the point in time is the moment when he was confronted by um, by Mia Farrow, and he ran and he ran and he grabbed p- pitchforks and came back with pitchforks and fire. Yeah. That's the moment in which I turn away. And I'm not saying that therefore the movie's made starting that year or the, I'm just saying as a person, that's where I departed shores. Now I don't know what happened before then. Maybe before then there was even more horrors, who knows? But all I know is that's where you leave me because yeah. I can have empathy for people that have done terrible things uh, based on what they've done afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Hannah and her sisters, just a classic Woody Allen, you know, movie with Mia Farrow, Michael Caine, Carrie Fisher, Crimes and Misdemeanors. This was the first one that I would have seen in the theater because I was in college. And I remember going down to the uh, theater on on the Ave. Um, what was that called? The Vars? No, there was the Varsity and then there was a... Neptune Varsity. Yeah. No, it was Varsity. And then there was okay. Neptune. Yeah. Anyway... Uh, Match Point, again, total departure. Have you seen Match Point with Scarlett Johansson and Jonathan Rhys Myers? No, I have not. 
it is a uh, it's was like it a th- that recent no it was 15 years ago but it was oh. it's a thriller okay. and oh. it's like a murder um thriller and it's it's not funny you know it and it's just a masterpiece of a movie uh vicky christie barcelona with uh penelope cruz javier bardem and um scarlett johansson just a beautiful movie uh, Midnight in Paris, light. Owen Wilson goes back in time to the times of Hemingway and uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Just a real, real cute movie. 2013, Blue Jasmine, Alec Baldwin, Kate Blanchett, Andrew Dice Clay. Uh, just a beautiful look into a character that Kate Blanchett plays. You know, she was this rich lady and then i think she went through a divorce or something and she didn't have anything anymore and all, all she had were or her expensive luggage and she it's just a it's just a beautifully written story and and a classic and you know he doesn't just have one or two classics he's got like you know 15 or 10 just yeah. like solid solid movies and and part of the film you can't talk about film history without talking about Woody Allen through several decades and yeah and um I was a huge fan and I was one of those people you know that would annoy people at parties you know yeah. like uh going like you gotta see uh interiors it's masterpiece Woody you know blah 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 blah, blah. like I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm one of those people and now I I, it, it, I don't know what to do because 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 yeah, the thing is hard. it's like I don't want to give him money if he's if he is yeah. a monster. I don't want to validate him. I don't want to see his face if he's a monster. But I have a relationship with interiors. Yeah. I, have, I have a relationship with with Hannah and her sister. Yeah. I've I have a relationship with Annie Hall. You know when Di- when Diane Keaton wears that outfit with the with the tie and the hat and the vest, like <laughs> and she and all of her quirkiness and insecurity. Like I have a relationship with her and that character. Yeah. And uh, that's a part of me. Yep, and, yep. Uh, it, uh, you know, when yeah. I listen to Pretty Young Thing, even that song, I'm transported back to when I was 11 years old and we had Thriller and we'd put it on the record player and me and all my family would listen front to back, front to back. And every, every my older siblings, my younger brother, or my parent, everyone loved that album. Everyone in the whole community, the videos, my cousins, my we would sit around and, oh, you know, uh, th- uh, beat it is on MTV. Everyone sit down and watch it. Everyone in the family just sit down and watch Michael O. Jack. He's the best. Is, and if he did it, then what do I do with that? Uh, yeah. The Bill Cosby Show, the Cosby Show. I I actually have something I have to admit. I was kind of just channel surfing about a month ago, and the Cosby Show came up, and me and my wife we watched an episode of it. Uh, because it said. You know, it's not an amazing show, but it's 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 delightful. You know, yeah. it, it's light. It's from that time. It's actually uh, w- something that was way before its time. In that, it, there's almost no white people in the entire show. In the fact, the episode that I saw, there wasn't any white people. Now, right? Is that a definition of a good show? No. But the progressiveness of not only having every family member black, but you don't have like a the token white neighbor but there was also the, the the oldest daughter was giving birth and so the doctors are black the nurses are black mm-hmm. the spouse is black you know everyone's black yeah this is middle of the 80s <laughs> this yeah. is a long time ago and bill cosby was the engineer of that he he was right. the one who said no i'm gonna strong arm NBC or whoever was in charge and you know that they were like we got to make this more relatable to white people most of your audience is white people you can't you got to have some white characters and Bill Cosby said no this is not going to happen yeah totally <laughs> imagine though so imagine um, imagine our, our mutual friend uh, Chong Chong shows up at your house one day and he grabs a, a bat and he hits you on the arm multiple times breaks your arm <laughs> and then you're telling me dude I'm like, hey, have you seen Chong? And you're like, no, I'll never see him again. I'm so upset at him. I might sue him. I'm like, what? what well, he broke my arm with a bat. Oh, wow. Anyways, I'm throwing a party this, this weekend. Oh, he's going to be here. 
You're like, wait, did you just hear what I said? Oh yeah, no, I mean that sucks. Like, yeah, don't get me wrong, I'll be upset at him. Yeah, but uh, anyways, he'll be here. He's, but, you know, he's fun at parties. Well, that's different. Okay, I get the analogy <laughs> and I appreciate it, but it's different because I'm not, I'm not calling Woody Allen and saying I love your work. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I know. I know. I, I'm privately sitting and watching a movie on Netflix or something. I, I just. I feel like imagine Chong is a, a creator, but, right? But, but it is, but it is something <laughs> because Dylan Farrow is a human being that deserves yeah. a lot of grace and justice. Yeah. And if I'm just, and, and you know, if I'm going to be a part of this, it's sort of like global warming is happening. Do I just say, well, what am I, you know, I'm just one person. Am, am I just supposed to say, well, I'm just one person, you know, Dylan Farrow and many other people who have been victimized or people who want to stand by victims are, you know, they're saying, okay, yeah, do I love the movies? Yeah, but it's a small price to pay to stand up for what's right and to stand by Dylan Farrow and to stand with other victims that I'm just not going to watch his movies and I'm also going to speak out. And, I'm, you know, uh, now one could argue that uh, on this podcast, we do a lot of advocacy, including this episode, um, maybe not particularly this episode, but we do a lot of episodes on victim advocacy maybe I've paid my dues so that I can watch his movies now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's hard because, like, you take the Chong example, Chong becomes famous. Uh, he's famous, he's all over the place. And he's got a TV show, that's what it is, he's got a TV show. And, again, you come over to my house and I'm watching the Chong show. And you're like, dude, and it's actually worse. It's not just that he broke your arm, he ruined your a lot of parts of your life. Well, I would expect that Dylan Farrow's friends are not watching Woody right. Allen movies when she right. comes over, but I'm not Dylan Farrow's friend, right. you know, and so... But then you go to the media and you tell everyone, and everyone's like, okay, okay. But then every cafe you go to, everywhere you go, people are watching the sh the Chong show. Yeah. And everyone's, not only that, they're talking about it. And then you tell well, them the story and they're like... Yeah, but you know, he's just so entertaining. But listen, I hear you because I have the same struggles with things I like. That it, Like Woody Allen, what, what's funny is you've watched so many Woody Allen movies. I was looking forward, honestly, that I had this long backlog of Woody Allen movies that I want to watch that I keep hearing so many great things about. And now I am have, like... Have you seen any of the Woody Allen movies I talked about? Uh, a couple, but most of them no. Yeah, and I, so I, then Stacy said, I'm, "Stacy, I'm just completely." It, the guy makes so many movies. How can you not see some of? Right. Stacy hasn't seen Annie Hall. Have you seen Annie Hall? Oh yeah, of course. Oh okay. And and but so I'm sitting there going, "Well, what do I do? I wanted to watch those movies. They're cinema history. I I've been looking forward to, like the Anne Barcelona, Vicky, whatever the hell. You I've love you love Javier Bardem. That. You got to see that one. I've been looking forward to that movie so long, dude. It's really good. And I love Owen Wilson and I love Alec Baldwin. Like I love all these people. Yeah. But I mean, they broke my arm. Yeah, I don't know if Blue Jasmine is at the top of the list, but Vicky Christina Barcelona, my arm Midnight is in Paris broken. is cute. Match Point, though, man, with Scarlett Johansson, Jonathan Rhys Myers, Match Point, so good. Hannah, sisters, Michael Caine, just so good, so yeah. good. Uh, Manhattan, uh, beautiful. Yeah, it's not. A and top and of let my me list. make another point, which is that I don't have proof, right? So. It's not like I'm saying like, yeah, we should boycott and all these. Okay. I have no proof. All I'm saying is like me personally, gosh, it, I find it really yeah. difficult after watching that documentary yeah. to watch this man acting yeah. on, a, on a movie. Now it's a movie he's not in, on screen. Maybe it's not as big of a problem for me. Yeah. When, when you talked through your passionate reasoning, I was like, oh boy, I, yeah. Uh, how, how could you, how can I now watch any, how can I even look at his face and not have a, my blood boiling um, uh, now that you've sort of put it that way. Now, I, I think Dylan is the main person that we should be caring about. And I, I don't know, but I suspect she doesn't care if I watch a movie. I think she cares mostly about, do I believe her? And do I advocate for victims who come forward and, advocate for people to listen to them and uh, you know tout the statistics that show that people almost never lie about this sort of thing and talk about how victims are often raked over the coals particularly when the perpetrator is famous and powerful uh, yeah. i'm pretty sure dylan mostly cares about that and that i will say that i will stand by dylan farrow that i will say i do believe her uh, i will state that i will state that she deserves justice. I will state that no one should be attacking her. 
And if you are like, what's wrong with, how would you possibly know <laughs> that she's lying? Uh, that there clearly isn't much evidence that she's lying. Uh, so, uh, at the very least you, you, the best you could say is you don't know, you know, the best you could say is, well, uh, you know, who knows? but to say that she's a liar or to attack her is, um, is, is criminal. And, you know, God bless you if you're one of those people and some, and someone does something to you and you come forward and no one believes you, how crappy would that be? Now, of course, there's a whole other set of people that are falsely accused of things. But anyway, the point is, is that, um, I, and, and not I, forgetting, not forgetting too, like Sun Yi and Mia and, uh, um, Mason, no, um, Moses, the other little boy, Moses and all the other little kids in that family who, uh, I mean, think of Mia, like, think of how, assuming that she's telling the truth, everyone's, think of how much trauma he caused her. Yeah. 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 The, the last thing I'll say is I want to buy a house just like theirs. And uh, it's the, one of the first thoughts I had is because the documentary, it t- t- you know, a lot of the interviews take place in their house, you know, yeah. me, me, the house that they grew up in. And I thought, because sometimes they'll rent a house to inter- to do interviews in. Actually, mm, Leaving yeah, Netherland right. was that way where they, I could tell that they rented a fancy house and mm-hmm. then interviewed them all in different parts of the house. And it, it, I, when I was seeing the beginning of this documentary, I was like, that house is too, too cute. It's too cool looking. That can't be the house that anyone lives in. But it is. I mean, the way it was even decorated. I want to decorate my house like that. <laughs> like, they, it just had all these little pieces of art and, you know, just kind of randomly distributed around the house and those big windows and that sloping lawn down to the water and (laughs) the, the little fences and uh, just the, the hominess of it all. And the, all the toys that are around, it just looked like a, it just looked like a comfortable artsy, fun, energetic, chaotic, but good. (laughs) I, I just, I want that house. Yeah. All right, well, that I does it for that. <laughs> that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>